All right. Um, I think that we will get started. Um, I can either read what's on my phone or I can put these on and see you, but it can't be both. Um, so I think I'll have to go with my phone. Um, I'm so excited that JT Torres is here with us today. Um, I will start by saying that um, I was trying to remember how we first met and uh, he was reminding me that he read something brilliant that Martha had written and he did what I just encourage everybody to do, which is he emailed and he was like, can, can we meet? Um, and so ultimately, uh, the three of us just started talking together about the work that we do, and it's just uh, blossomed into a really fruitful um, professional relationship. So let me give you a bit of his background, um, and then I will turn it over to JT. We will have time for Q&A at the end, so hopefully, um, you know, if you're thinking about things, just keep them in mind. And also, if you do need, whatever you need to do to be comfortable, whether you need to stand, take a break, use the bathroom, get some more food, just please do that um, all through the presentation. So uh, JT Torres earned a PhD in educational philosophy, uh, psychology, educational philosophy, that sounds good, um, from Washington State University, and he researches the relationship between learning and identity, focusing on the social interactions that shape the ways learner define, learners define themselves. Both his scholarship and teaching are informed by his experience in creative writing. So I think um, a whole separate area here will be of interest to our writing faculty. Uh, he has an MFA from Georgia College and State University, and JT employs creative methods and strategies to intersect what William James referred to as the art and science of teaching. His co-authored book, Situated Narratives and Sacred Dance, shares stories of religious practitioners in Cuba who learn social identities through ritual spirit possession ceremonies. He also has a novella called Taking Flight, which tells the story of a Cuban-American child who must discover his family secret before they disappear from history. He directs the Center for Teaching and Learning at Quinnipiac University, and I have really enjoyed uh, learning from him in the months um, since we've gotten to know each other. So please join me in welcoming JT Torres. Thank you, everyone. Um, first, just nothing but gratitude for making space for me, for inviting me here to beautiful New Hampshire and Columbus State University. Super grateful for being here. Um, and I also just want to really encourage you to check out that cash bar because I promise the more you drink, the better this talk's going to get you. <laughs> <laughs> for all of us. So, Robin's introduction of me is amazing, and I'm also grateful for that. But a lot of my journey as a learner has been met with struggle. And that struggle is what shapes a lot of what I do in directing the Center for Teaching and Learning, how I think about teaching, and what does it mean to foster these positive relationships in the classroom. So I just wanted to share a little bit about that as an introduction and how this all connects. When I was going through school, whether that was um, elementary school, middle school, high school, or college, I never felt like I, would, I belonged. I never felt included. I was always outside of the system. I firmly believe the system was not designed for me except for the fact that I'm white. Like, that part did work for me. But everything else, like, I was like, this system is not going well. I grew up with ADHD, still have ADHD. You can probably tell by how fidgety I am. I also grew up in a uh, Cuban, to Cuban Americans, um, refugees during the Mariel boat lift, who predominantly spoke Spanish but thought that I should only speak English, which means I ended up in speech therapy, um, which means that growing up, I was constantly put into courses that were called special education, or emergent learning, or English language learning. Um, so it's just constantly labeled as being outside of the system. Um, when I got to college, I, I'm technically not a first generation student, but both my dad and my brother were kicked out of college. So not the best models, so maybe I'm like 1.5 generation. Had no idea how college worked. I literally had no idea what a major was. I went to school, the first time I met my advisor was my junior year of college, first time. So I was just taking the classes that I thought were interesting. I, I started college a couple years after 9-11, so I took a class on Islamic philosophy. Um, I was really interested in writing, so I took a poetry class, I took a literature class, I uh, was really interested in video games, so I took a computer science class, and that did not go well. Um, so I was just taking whatever was speaking to me. When I met my advisor for the first time my junior year, she was so confused by my track record. She was like, so your electives are good. There's that. <laughs> but what are you going to graduate with? And, I, and I'm using junior year. This was like my fifth year. 
Um, so she, was, she looked over my transcript and she was like, I think you're closest to a creative writing major. Let's do that. I was like, sure, okay, that's great. Um, did that. Um, I would never, again, not like really feeling that I'm part of academia, but now I have this creative writing degree, went and got my MFA. So I thought like maybe I should be outside of academia. So I did what most academics do when, I, when they want to be outside of the system. And I went to teach at a community college. I was like, because now I'm really like in the streets, like doing what I need to be doing. Um, did that for a little bit, and then somebody recommended that I get a PhD in educational psychology. Did not know what that field was. Um, so I, I met the faculty um, in ed psych, learned that it is a heavily quantitative psychometric field. Like we want to measure learning. We want to take this social construct and we want to be able to quantify it. Um, we want to do some causal analyses on what leads to what in a very clean, linear fashion. And these, this wasn't really speaking my language, but they were inviting me into a space. And I had never been invited into a space in academia. So I went. And my, I'm there struggling a little bit because I think at heart I'm a qualitative researcher. That's what I really did become. I do a lot of discourse analysis. At the time, though, I'm still trying to figure out my footing. And there was this moment when my mentor, his name is Olusola Arasope, he, did, he went through a lot of great lengths to try to foster an environment of belonging for, for our students. Um, he would say things like, never call me Dr. Adesope, just call me Shola. Um, he would host cookouts and invite us over. But I could still tell. I was like, we're not really colleagues, though. You're super smart. You got those letters. I don't. Um, but there was this one moment when he invited me into his office. He, was, he reviews for the Journal of Educational Psychology. And he had a submission that was sent to him. And it was a qualitative study. And so he called me into his office. He's like, this is your interest. I don't really know what this study's trying to do. Do you want to review it? And at that moment, like everything switched. From that moment to me standing here was like a WOMCOM montage of just like me being in different educational spaces where I'm feeling more and more confident because I was invited into the space with this one question of, can you help me? This is something that you have that I don't think I have. Totally flipped those years of learning that I had experienced beforehand. So at this moment, um, I know I'm here to talk about how, do, how we design belonging, how we can be intentional in creating environments of belonging. I'm gonna do my best to try to model that through this interaction, through this talk that I'm giving. I, I try to do everything I can to highlight and emphasize student voice from the moment they walk into the class so they know this is about you, not about me. It's the same thing now, right? Like this event is about you, it's not about me. I just shared this story of the first time that I felt like I belonged in academia. I want to do a quick think pair share so I can get to know some of you. Um, if you want to turn around and talk to your neighbor, if you want to just have a conversation in your table group, when was that first time for you? I don't want to make assumptions for anyone in this room, but a lot of the people that I work with, who are faculty, um, staff, students, they're really smart. You are super smart. So I constantly carry with me this assumption that is probably inaccurate, but I still carry it with me that everybody has their stuff together Right? And I'm still in this path of struggle. But I don't think that's real. Right? I think we're always trying to reinvent ourselves and figure out who we are. And I don't know how often we reflect on this question. So a few minutes for you, and I'll walk around so I can get to know some of you. When did you first feel like you belonged in academia? When was that switch? <laughs> So think pair share. You can take some time to think first. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for the conversations. This is how like I stylistically operate, like whether I'm talking to students or giving. Nobody's gonna listen. We're too interested in ourselves. That's it. So that so you you just gave the secret sauce. So this is what I meant. Um, this is like stylistically what I do. Um, I know it's weird. It's like here's this guest speaker who comes up and talks for five minutes and then disappears. <laughs> here's what happens with belonging, right? Robin, you're absolutely right. Uh, we are human beings. We're interested in ourselves, and especially if we're thinking about traditional students at that age range of 18 to 20. Their brains operate around social nutrition, right? The more they socially interact with one another, we're getting serotonin, dopamine release, we are feeling better, we are feeling confident, we're feeling connected. As a faculty member, it is not my, it is not possible for me to be the center of belonging, right? I, I used to think about this, I use a lot of inquiry-based approaches to my pedagogy. I try to start at the heart of what we know works really well, situational interests, right? We know that when individuals are interested in the situation that's going on, in a classroom, in a job, in a social setting, they are much more likely to tap into available cognitive resources to do whatever is being asked of them. Right? So this interest, though, it cannot come from the faculty member completely. 
I, like, I might have tricked Robin because she invited me here, but I'm not really an interesting person, right? But everybody has their interests. So when we do these little breakouts, and I, I try to do something like this, first five minutes of every single class, different kind of prompts, once you're talking to each other, it does take a little bit of work to bring us back together. Thank you, Robin, for helping. But now we have cognitive, um, cognitive activation, our hearts are activated, and we're already fostering belonging. We tend to think, you know, belonging, inclusion, equity, these words are not only buzzwords, but they're also really big, huge words. And we think about the amount of systemic transformation that is required to really create an inclusive society. We're not there yet, we know that. But we do have spheres of influence in the relationships that we foster and how we interact with one another where we can create these micro moments, much more possible for us. We have the agency to do this. I work with a lot of faculty and individuals who are like, help me decolonize my syllabus. And I was like, I don't know what that means. Like, I just imagine like indigenous Marie Kondo coming and telling you to do it. Um, you don't have to think that big. It's like, what opportunities are you creating for people to have conversations with one another? Um, as I, I didn't get to visit with everybody, but in hearing some of your stories, that first time that you felt that you belonged, for the, from what I heard, was largely accidental, right? Like you might have met somebody. There was an opportunity. There was a door that opened for you. These were not explicitly designed for the most part. So how can we bring it into our spheres of influence and make that happen explicitly? Recently, Purdue Gallup um, released a study of like 32,000 undergraduates um, who are at the cusp of graduation or just graduated, got the job that they wanted, or entering into the career um, that they wanted, or they're just happy that they were approaching graduation, and that was a big milestone for them. And the survey was asking what were the major indicators of that success? Like, what happened for them to reach that milestone and surpass it? Um, it's called the big six, the data that comes out of that, uh, they're already nodding. We're just gonna focus on three that I think are amazing. Um, because they're low-hanging fruit, super easy that we can do, um, and also just like really powerful for us as human beings. The first one is that they had a mentor who knew them by their name. Like that was it, like you just knew their name. The second one, they had a mentor who encouraged them to pursue their dreams and goals, even if that didn't relate to the course, the content, or the job context. And then the third, they had a mentor who believed in them as a person. They felt holistically cared for. I call these low-hanging fruits because in thinking about the huge systemic transformations that we still need to do to create an inclusive society, just knowing someone by their name, is that all I have to do to tell students, like to communicate to students that they can be successful? Now, I've had classes where I have 100 plus students. I cannot know everybody's name all the time. I'm going to make some confusion, some, I'm, I'm gonna mess up. But there are things that we can do that studies support. For instance, if I know one person's name, like right now, because I know Robin and Martha, I know their names, I might not know everybody's name in this room yet, but if I just refer to them by their name, it creates the secondary effect where you're like, oh, he knows our names. If I offer to students, class is about to end, I'm gonna hang back and talk to you if you wanna talk to me. Nobody really takes me up on that, but I get in my emails all the time that I make that offer. So we might feel disheartened that like, no one talked to me after class, but when you make that offer, Right? You're creating that emotional resonance for individuals and they feel that they have that belief. So the secret sauce that I'm offering you, and then we're gonna do another activity because I like to emphasize your voice. Um, the secret sauce is think about those micro interactions that we can create. And those micro interactions are often based in empathy. There's this really interesting term that's coming out of work in CRIP studies, um, and it's called double empathy. And the studies looking into people who identify with autism and how often individuals who identify with autism, the burden is placed on them to change their behavior so that they can be seen as neurotypical. Um, so this term, double empathy, means that no, when we're in a human interaction, empathy is a shared responsibility. We all have to develop the listening skills, the empathy, we all have to know how to censor one another. It does not matter about the range of ability or the spectrums that someone might be on. And so we can think about this concept of double empathy and we can apply it to different contexts such as student, teacher, um, staff, faculty, um, faculty, faculty, whatever that dyad is, how are we both carrying the responsibility of displaying and operating through empathy? Here's the activity for us. Um, if I can ask you to please choose one partner, do that first and then I'll tell you the next step. 
We might not have an, an, an even number of people, so that's why I'm just like, if we could do some math really quickly, and if there is a group of three, that's fine. No, there are, like, should we switch up? Sure, uh, no, it doesn't matter. Whatever you're comfortable doing. Whatever you're comfortable doing. <laughs> if possible, too, but if, if we don't have an even number, we can do a three. What if I put be a cool. <laughs> does, yeah, does everybody have a new friend? All right. So this activity, I, I do this frequently on the first couple weeks of the semester, just again to center how important empathy is in my classes. I also do this when I do executive education. I do this with executives, middle managers, largely with Hartford Healthcare and MIT Bank. And then I also do this with faculty and staff um, engagements. This helps us practice listening and empathy. The first round of this activity is each of you and your dyad and your partnership is going to share a win that you're, re that you're happy about. A win in the classroom, a win as a scholar, a win in your job, a win in your social life, whatever that is, what is a recent win that your heart is on fire and joy about at this moment? Each person take a turn sharing that story with each other. After this round, I'll walk you through this, but I just want you to have a little bit of a long view. We're going to tell our partner's story using the first person I to see how well we are at listening and putting ourselves in that person's experience. But I will walk you through that. There are some steps we'll take. I'll scaffold it, I'll support, you're good. Just want you to know where we're headed. So let's just take about 10 minutes and do some story share. What are some wins? So we'll do a gentle return. I know, I know. So here's, here's what I do with the, since I do a lot of breakouts, um, I've developed this strategy from being a dog owner. I bring my dog in the dog park, and what I do when I'm at the dog park is I let my dog know, you have two minutes and then we're going to come home. That, that never works. <laughs> so what happens when I say that is like, we're gone 30 minutes later. But, um, at least like there's a there's like a notice that's been told and she's a little bit better behaved. She doesn't understand anything I'm saying. So neither do my students. She does speak you <laughs> I know, I, I think she does understand a little bit. But yeah, so I do I use a gentle we're gonna be coming back in a minute, even if that's really five minutes, but at least there was there's not a startling disruption of the conversation. Well, all right, before round two. I'm genuinely interested. I've gone through this as a student, as a participant, um, many times, and I, I think about my role and the identity that I'm supposed to, or that I think I'm supposed to cultivate as a professor, um, and there's the root verb, and that is to profess, and I think a lot of us are just very comfortable filling the space. I remember being a first time faculty member and in the classroom when I would ask a question and how terrified I was of the silence and how I'm learning now to be comfortable with the silence because that's where thinking happens. I was once um, a professor at University of Alaska Anchorage and I went there right out of my graduate school um, and I was just very used to my rapid tone, my, my, my rapid speed, my, my tone, I just constantly filling the space and one of my students, um, native student, came up to me after class and said it's really hard to participate in this class because in, for me, I have been taught that I should not think about my response until the person's done talking. And when you ask the question, you essentially just answer your own questions because you let us think. And that was just life changing for me to realize how important it is for professors to also listen. And what can I do to flip the script a little bit and not think about me filling up the space, but thinking about prompts and activities for people to fill the space and me to listen and respond. So now I am genuinely interested as a listener for you who just went through this um, very, very brief part of the activity, knowing that we're gonna do something a little bit higher stakes where you have to represent your partner authentically as if that first person I, what was it like to tell your story knowing that that was our goal? Did anybody think too deeply about this? Or did you just share? We both forgot Okay, good. That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> I always go back and forth on whether I should tell you what the goal is. 
I was, yeah, go ahead. I felt, I felt like I needed to take notes Good. Mm -hmm. to be able to share Kate's perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I, probably that took my attention away from actually listening mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. her as much as I could, mm -hmm. trying to balance listening with also making sure I understood what she was saying. Yes, yeah. So that's really fascinating to hear your response right after we forgot it was the goal because knowing what the goal is, again, like a lot of our interactions, our social interactions, as faculty member it becomes institutionalized, whereas I'm listening for a student, I just need to know if you know the answer so I can move on in my presentation, right? Is that really listening versus me trying to use assessment live in the moment so I can just move on with my content? Yeah, how much does the goal get in the way of us actually relating? Yeah. I was also thinking, um, you know, I know this is very meta, right? That we're just demonstrating something, but I was also thinking about just belonging on the faculty and how I sort of feel like I've lost. It's been hard, you know, and and it's been a lot of it's been a long time since I sat in this room. We used to do in the old days a lot more of that and so I almost well Suzanne was telling such a beautiful story I was getting teary but I was also getting teary just feeling just for a moment talking with a colleague mm -hmm. that I belonged on the faculty with my colleague and that was um, something that I actually didn't because you know, my work is now always with faculty but I didn't realize I was missing that as much. That is a really interesting and also heartfelt reflection um, I, I'm going to share with you because I'm not at my institution. I would not share this at my institution. I think one of the great things that came out of the pandemic is that I don't have to attend department meetings in person anymore. <laughs> Love that. And here's why. Department meetings are just so overscheduled, right? Like we attend them and it's all business, business, business. And sometimes I just want to talk to someone else about like, what did you do in your class? Did it work? Did it not work? We don't get those moments. Like we are so structured frequently. I'm talking about my institution when I say we, right? Um, and so. I like the fact that we can just do it on Zoom if that's all it's gonna be. If it's gonna be depersonalized anyways, then let me be in my living room. <laughs> but otherwise, can we have department meetings where, and again, the we is for Quinnipiac, um, can we have department meetings where 10 minutes is check in, um, peer groups, reflection groups, um, have like some community building, some collaboration, like can we set some goals for ourselves? I wanna grow as a faculty member. I'm just laughing because all these people are like, yeah. Yeah, but you know, like you go back here, <laughs> people who are here be like, guess what we're gonna do, guys? <laughs> <laughs> oh my oh, god. It's actually funny because well, we, we do we do take ten minutes of yeah, time. Yeah, we're awesome. so so sure. sure. <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot to share. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say the the habits of mind that I experienced faculty have been doing quite a bit of that is like talking from our perspectives, and I think it's too much. Yeah. Maybe that's <laughs> we're in a space where we don't know, like, we don't know each other in the same way as disciplines who get together, because you kind of know what your perspectives are, you, people have been there, and so we've been spending actually a lot of time doing that in our meetings. Ooh, that's good. All right, so I've also been trying to fill space to see if I can get a little bit of short-term memory loss to kick in a little bit, so we can up the ante. Um, next, next round, we're gonna do. We're gonna go on a double date. So with your partner, find another set of partners. So there should be groups of four or five if there was an odd number group. Okay. Same partner, same group. Same partner, and then just add another group. <laughs> Okay, so you have your you have your new double date. Here's here's how this is gonna work. Um, each person go around. You are going to tell your partner's story using the first person I. We're gonna do some method acting. You become your partner. Um, don't shift to that third person pronoun. And partners, do your best not to correct. Trust your partner and see what details they are able to represent in telling the story of your win. Yeah, let's see how this goes. See, the two minute thing works. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you for doing the weird things that I ask you to do. Um, I, I was once invited to a different department meeting as CTL director, not as a faculty member, um, to work with uh, the people in the department around some student concerns and issues that they were having. So I used this format where people had to express their student concerns using the first person I from the point of view of the student. And it was amazing how many times the faculty came to their own, like, not necessarily solutions, but plans to go back to that student. They were like, oh, I never yeah. thought of that. Um, a lot, so this exercise was introduced to me by an organization called Narrative 4. Um, it's an amazing group, kind of like the moth that uses storytelling as a process for personal change. Um, this really resonated for me the first time because I remember a specific story, again, as a young faculty member where you know, I had my policies in place, like due dates, um, attendance policies, and so on. And I had two particular students in this course, same course. Um, one student was missing class pretty frequently, was communicating with me about it. Um, this student uh, was a veteran and was uh, going through some issues, personal issues that, this, that they were sharing with me pretty transparently, um, missed some assignments, missed some classes, and I had nothing but empathy for this student. I was like, we'll figure it out, well, whatever, don't worry about the policy, we'll figure it out. There was another student, same exact class, same exact behavior, and I was not as empathic. I wasn't getting details from this student, right? So I was just defaulting to my own assumptions, and I remember one night, kind of venting to my partner about like this, so let's do student X, student Y. Student X was the veteran who was communicating with me, missing class, and I cared deeply. Um, student Y, um, I was venting about student Y to my partner, and I was like, this, they just don't care, they're not showing up, like I, I don't know what to do. Um, do I just like forget the student? Do I submit some kind of report and try to get counselors in, involved and say like, where is where's this person? And she said to me, she was like, it sounds like you're talking about the same person. Like about student X and student Y. She's like, it sounds like they're the same. Why are you so upset about this one? And I had this question to myself that struck me. Who am I showing up for? What kind of preferential treatment am I giving? How am I limiting or even politicizing my own empathy for particular students who have the journeys that I want them to have versus these other students? So I came back to student Y um, and I just sent an email like not just, like in that time period of my life, I sent an email to that student, just asked and just checked in, and then that student also told me a pretty heartbreaking story. And at that moment, you know, when I tell this story now to other faculty members, like they always like, did you get documentation? Um, and I was like, I didn't care. Like the, the story, right, which had to do with tragedy in their family, I was like, you know, it might be that their grandmother died for the third time, or it might be that their grandmother really did die, and I don't want to play that role of calling them out. If they're lying to me, they're lying to me. Um, and if not, like, I'd rather default on that error of, like, let them lie to me if they're lying to me versus me calling them out and they really weren't lying to me. And so I thought about, like, how powerful this thing empathy is, but also, like, how intentional and conscious it needs to be when I'm asking myself, who am I showing up for as an educator? Um, but let's, let's bring it back to you and your exercises. Uh, storytellers, somebody want to share what that was like to represent someone else's experience? Yeah, tell me how. No, this is great. Like, I mean, this is why we all, like, the things that we do to feel and experience other people's success and mm -hmm. be part of that, right? That's, and so telling the story and being able to, the, the passion and enthusiasm of this successful thing just felt great to tell. I loved it. That's amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Thoughts? Any other reflections on what that was like? Thank you. Uh, kind of similar a lot of the stories were. It was a lot about, like, especially um, in our group, or in our little quartet, a lot about, like, student success and, like, feeling, um, and even, like, us feeling a sense of belonging with that success, too. Cool. Yeah, like, finding themes and patterns, right? Like, how frequently we might feel isolated, either in our wins or our losses, right? We feel isolated, and, and having this realization is like, oh, you had that, too. God, I feel so much better now. Like that's the joyous element, right? The connection, which we don't always get if we don't have those spaces of story share. Yeah, any other? Yeah, thank you. I, I found I was easily able to share the energy of that person's experience, but not necessarily all of the details. Ooh. And, and it reminded me often of, um, that's, that's my remembrance of courses that I had in, in college. It's like, I remember the experience of being in there. 
without necessarily remembering the details, but that experience is the long lasting part. Yeah. Sometimes. There was a recent article in Inside Higher Ed um, that was talking about a study that found that students resonate more with teacher dispositions in terms of how the content is taught versus what the actual plans were. Um, where, like, you can have like this really excellent designed course, but if you aren't bringing a certain energy, like students really resonate with that. Which kind of, like, again, I think of these things in terms of low-hanging fruit. It's kind of the easier thing to do <laughs> to be contagious in terms of the, that energy that you bring. You had your hand up, Mark. I just wanted to piggyback on what Brad said because I, you know, when we did the debrief right before that, and people were saying they kind of lost, they got so into the story they realized they they were weren't taking as detailed notes in their head, <laughs> and I was like, oh, I don't think that was me. And then I went to retell it, and I was like, oh, that's totally me. Like, <laughs> uh, and, and like when Hannah first started talking and telling me her story, I was like, I'm going to listen so carefully, and I'm going to repeat this word for word. Like, I'm going to get this right. But when I went to tell the story, like, I, I knew the story. I could tell the broad strokes. I knew the energy of it. But it also, like, just made me think about empathy and, like, the fact that, like, even when people share with us, we can take some of this, right? But some of it, we, like, it's not, some of it isn't transferable easily, mm -hmm. right? And that's okay too. But like Hannah's story is Hannah's story and I can empathize with it and I can absorb that energy and I can, I can repeat it back and I can share it, but I can't necessarily experience mm -hmm. it the same way. Yep. You know? Yeah. Wow, that's powerful. Thank you, Martha. All right, what about listeners? What was that experience like to hear your story? Even if the details weren't right, <laughs> what was that experience like for you? Did, who had an urge to correct? That's, okay, okay. <laughs> Were you cleared up? We did that on purpose. And I noticed that you made a choice. <laughs> <laughs> a little revisionism is fine. <laughs> I mean, I think one of the reasons you have an urge, and I have an urge to correct it, and, and one reason to be careful, right, is like even though nothing mattered in, you know, all of the important things are there, but it is somehow like your life, right? Mm -hmm. And so it does, it does make sense that you want to listen actively, but kind of like you were saying, you don't want to try to tell someone, like you might want to reflect to someone, here's what I'm hearing and I'm hearing you, but you don't want to ventriloquize somebody else's yeah. story, right? Yeah. Like yeah. it's theirs and it's so exactly. deeply personal yeah. that, you know, I, it's almost a little uncomfortable because, you know, you're like, if you guys really want to know how this is, like I'll just tell you. Right? <laughs> um, so I think you have to be, uh, I think it does go back to what you're saying. Yeah. Be sensitive to like you're not really going to know even when they tell you. And right? then even if you said it word for word, it wouldn't be the same story. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. I think I immediately got into a mode in my brain where I sort of like Elizabeth said, where I was like, I need to listen and be really, really paying attention to everything and like sort of like almost fixing it so that I wouldn't miss things. So I found my me sitting on the listening side, I was like super tuned in and trying to like, I remember, I don't remember, I don't remember. Like a really active listening. Yeah. How did that translate to listening to your story when it was told? Did, did you have that like same kind of prerogative or did you like, like, did it compare? Um, it, no, I think I, I felt like, because Alice did, did my story and I thought she did a great job. She remembered all the details. <laughs> energy and everything too, but I think I just, because I didn't know which of the two I was going to do, so I was like, i got to remember both of these because I don't know which one I'm going to say back. Um, but yeah, I just think it, too, it for me, just as a listener, it really tuned me into being careful about listening in a way that I think maybe I don't always. Oh, no. Yeah. One thing I want to quickly share because Bridget shared my story, and I actually felt really listened to because there was some, there was like a detail you shared about like what you, that I don't I don't remember expressing, but you caught me. Did I make it up? No, <laughs> because, you, because you know me, and we've talked to other times, and so my you know what I 
what I was feeling inside, you kind of inferred and were able to share. And like, that's that's a piece that comes of this that I don't, no. I wouldn't even intend that. It's like, you know, when we get to know our students, that we, yes. we just hear a little bit from them. Yeah, exactly. We, we know that much more, too. Exactly, yeah. I'll respond to that in a second, but I want to give Matt a chance. I, I taught myself, first when I chose the story, I chose something that I didn't feel especially possessive of, mm -hmm. and so I was very deliberate in choice, and then I just didn't, because I didn't want to be represented by somebody else. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, yeah. So, and then I didn't really listen all that carefully, I found it very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. It was much more fun just to, to pretend to be kind of them. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that that is great. That should be the, the tagline for your life. Like it's more fun to be me. <laughs> but no, that's not it. Like can't you say that? Yeah, yeah, you can't just say that. <laughs> but it's also a great point about the way that you are making all the introverts in this room like die a small death. <laughs> that's the new title for this presentation. <laughs> very unnatural for some yep. students to yep. do this kind of work, right? Absolutely, yeah. Um, I felt a little vulnerable. Yes. Um, because, I mean, I was fully aware of the story that I was sharing, and um, but I didn't expect to feel so vulnerable hearing it back. Uh, and it was almost like, for as a listener, being like, if someone had told that story that wasn't me, and I, it would have really had like an emotional effect on me. And so hearing it from someone else was like, I could take myself out of that experience and be like, oh, that is quite the experience. I don't know, it's hard, it's hard to describe. No, no, I, I, I think you're describing that perfectly. Um, a lot of you know what I shared with you today was very calculated. I opened up with a story of vulnerability because I knew what I was gonna ask of you. Right, so I wanted to tell you a story of my failures, my struggles, and that leads it. So therefore, I'm never asking anybody in a room to do something that I'm not doing. Same thing with my students. And what's really interesting with my students, I, um, I don't know, like, you know, you all have your ways of how you introduce yourself in your class the first day of the semester. I like to share stories of my failures and how I rebounded that with, with my students. And what was weird, one year in my student evaluations, um, someone wrote, JT fails a lot and I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that's what I wanted you to get from this, but it was a plus for my, um, so yeah. Thank you, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I found it, it's, it's easy for me to tell Eden's story because I was in a situation where we had three kids and I was building a house, teaching school, and I book, you know, writing things at the same time. But I find it sometimes hard with some of my students that are flunking and doing poorly because I never, I never flunk. Mm. You know, so it's hard yep. to, 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 to see what their mindset is because my mindset was never there, you know. Exactly, exactly right. And that, that's what I meant, you know, where I have, I have these certain assumptions, you know, both as a student and as a faculty member and often as a CTL director, which is why I did reach out to Martha and Robin, you know, when I did, um, not only did Martha's writing and thinking blow me away and I was like, I just want to be friends with you, but it was also like I was in my job for the first time directing CTL and part of that email, which Robin didn't share, was when I emailed them, I was like, can you help me? I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> And, and so like I, I have always viewed um, other, like again, you are amazing people and every university that I go to, I meet amazing people. I'm like, oh man, you're so much more amazing than me. I don't know if I have that, right? Because I see myself in reverse of how you're expressing it, where I see myself as the person who flunks a lot and then everyone else is excelling with no problems at all. But again, having these moments of empathy dispels that and reminds us what you shared, where like, we're actually more similar in our experiences and that's what breaks it down for us. Um, I want to just share with you that I think uh, the flyer that went out had a little bit of clickbait on it. One, I don't have hair. 
to, um, I know I promised uh, like really specific strategies for like what you do in your classroom, but I wanna just remind you that when we're talking about inclusion and belonging, um, a lot of research shows this as well, there really isn't a 10 step program for it, right? We can't script inclusion and belonging because it has to be authentic and it relies on these messy social interactions that we're all talking about, like I feel vulnerable. Well like, how do you do like a three step pedagogical strategy for creating vulnerability in your classroom? Um, you can't just follow that script. It often comes back to, and this is what you were making me think of in your response, it comes back to disposition and attitude and how we inhabit and navigate those spaces. So again, I have policies in my class, right? I have an attendance policy. But if a student breaks that attendance policy and I have a story share moment where like, I'm not experiencing what you're experiencing, but I can tell you are really challenged by this scenario, I'm not going to stick to my policy, right? I'm gonna to stick to the human. Same thing with deadlines and due dates and grades and also feedback. Assessment is a form of listening. Assessment is just a variation of the game we just played. Um, in my dissertation, when I, uh, when I analyze how students form their identities based on the feedback they get from faculty members, I use a think aloud protocol, so I, I tape recorded faculty members as they were providing feedback, and I wanted them to think out loud, I asked them to think out loud, why are you providing the comments that you're providing? What do you think this is gonna do? And then I asked students when they read that feedback for the first time, how are you interpreting this feedback? What does it say about you? And so I would have faculty members in, in this study that would leave comments saying, this student needs to be challenged here, this doesn't really make a lot of sense to me, and, and so I'm gonna comment here to have them think differently about how they might open up an essay. And then when that student read that comment, the interpretation was, I'm just not really good at writing, I do everything wrong. Like there's no affirmation in any of these comments, I don't, like I'm just not a writer. And that immediately, that immediate internalization into I'm not or I can't, the fixed mindset that can emerge from these interactions, a lot of it is invisible to us. We don't realize that we have our goals in terms of here's what I think I'm communicating, but that listening piece often gets lost in assessment. It's almost what you were talking about, Robin, about um, how we might impose our own story as an educator onto other people's lived experiences instead of thinking about assessment as truly listening in the moment and guiding people through. So, I know I, I just said that you know, there aren't real takeaways, but like maybe one is I always, with every feedback that I provide a student, at least once, I'm either gonna thank them or provide some kind of affirmation. As in like, you did this right, this was amazing. Or like, this really blew me away, this inspired me. Um, because we always think about correcting, right? That urge to correct also comes, to, comes into play when we're doing assessment. And so how can I affirm? And if there really isn't anything to affirm and that student just needs a lot of work, I'm still gonna thank them. Like, thank you for doing this. Thank you for opening up my mind to this. Thank you for pursuing this topic. Thank you for this choice you made, um, whatever it is, to try to create that bond and connection. Cool. So the last thing that I will share with you is back to that story of you know, those two students that had student X, student Y. Um, it's, it makes a lot of sense for us to think about that energy that we bring and how it reflects the identity that we want, not just for ourselves, but for our students and how we're inviting them into space and place. I also made a joke about how Zoom is great for me to get out of department meetings, but also like the scary side of it is there's a lot of rapid movement towards more asynchronous learning environments, which is fine, right? Like this is the world that we're living in. You can go on YouTube and learn how to build a house, right? Wikipedia is just a database of facts. Knowledge and content is available for free everywhere. So what is the point of higher education, in-person higher education, and it has to be this, right? It has to be the connection, it has to be the space that we equally share, and it has to be the learning from one another. Um, the lecture, like the mode of lecture, like Ted took that, right, and Ted does it well. I don't think it's coming back to us. So what can we do to create moments where we are doing story share and we are learning from one another collectively, collaboratively, together, and that will create that belonging. Thank you all so much for having me here. Um, this is amazing. And I'll hang out. Do you want to do some Q&A? I think so, yeah. Um, you know, I don't know that this has to be a traditional Q, but uh, <laughs> I, I feel like if anybody has a comment or a question, uh, we should take a few minutes to do that, and then we can, you know, go back to the food and water. So, um, anybody have anything they want to ask? Yeah, I don't have a question, but when you were talking about the feedback piece, that really resonated with me because um, I've been reading a lot of my students' reflective pieces, and I spend a lot of time trying to give feedback, just like what you were describing. Those are the types of things that I think about when I give feedback. And 
one of my students this semester shared with me like how important that was to her. Mm -hmm. And because she felt that sometimes she wasn't even really sure if her professors like read the yep. work. Because they she only saw a grade or she only saw certain types of comments and so I just wanted to echo like that important piece, at least from one student's perspective. You no, know, I've, I've heard that a lot in my own cases. There's also a lot of studies to support that as well. Um, just that, again, think about this empathy exercise that we all just experienced, right? We just want to be like hearing our stories told back and how affirming or joyous that might have been. Same thing with student work. Like it is a piece of themselves, whether it's writing or math or philosophy or whatever the content, it is a piece of themselves. And they just want to know that it was valued before they get their value. Thank you. Um, this is something maybe I think we'll talk about a little bit more at Jam Jam, and I'm not sure, I think a couple of you were in the retention workshop. That's actually quite a coyote. No, this is quite uh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, We talked about this in the retention workshop, but uh, I, and I can't remember the college, I'll, I'll have this for you in you know, better documented form when we do it more formally, uh, but they, this, one institution um, adopted uh, this four-pronged plan for uh, around belonging, which really was around belonging, but it was particularly for retention. And they got um, a 24% retention bump out of the people who participated in what they called, you know, the, the beta class or, you know. So the four things, they were so similar to the things that you talked about. I don't know if I can get them all, but I think I can. One was that the people in these, um, the faculty in these uh, beta courses agreed to learn the names of every student in the class. Mm -hmm. So that was 25% of their initiative, was to learn <laughs> the names of the students in the class, which probably for some faculty was actually a thing they had to do, right? They had to like commit to cue cards and whatever. Um, the next one was that they committed to meeting with every student one-on-one -on -one for 10 minutes over the course of the semester at some point. So they conferenced with every single student for 10 minutes. The third was that in the first three weeks of class, they gave some formative feedback. So, um, you know, not just assessment, but some assessment that explained how they could improve. And the fourth was that they explained a path to improvement. So they basically said they, they, they committed to showing every student, regardless of where they were, that there were ways that they could, in fact, succeed in the class. So if a student had a certain problem, they would commit to saying, oh, the writing center is going to be the help for you, or you can, we can do a tutor, or whatever, so that every student would, regardless of how poorly they were doing at the beginning, would have that um, the sense that the teacher believed that there was a path and they were going to be responsible for helping them on the path. It's, it's so similar to the stuff that you talked about, and I, it just feels, again, like that low-hanging fruit, mm -hmm. but you have to be deliberative, right, about all of those things. Um, and the other part is, like, what do we do as a faculty? And this may be a question for you. Mm -hmm. It will not surprise you to know that the people in this room <laughs> are already rolling at it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so do you have, I mean, you know, you and I talk about this a lot, but like, what, what are some of the methods that the faculty in this room can use or may can use to uh, work with some of our colleagues who are maybe much more focused on like, I got accreditation, I got content, that's my job. If if they don't care enough to show up, you know, then that's on them. And they're, you know, well, like, what do you say with that kind of a? Yeah. So um, I hear a lot about like the the whole choir metaphor. Like, you know, the choir's here, and first of all, the choir needs love. So I, I still think that's important, but also like each of you. <laughs> oh my gosh, they will make us love your choir. <laughs> <laughs> right, because like we will burn out if we don't have a choir, right? So we should um, feed our souls and, and just, if we're the only people in the room, we're the only people in the room for the moment. But also like near peer learning is a very powerful thing. We know that about students. That's why we like group work and teamwork when it's done well. Right, it, it works very, very well because near peer learning is a thing. Studies have found that new drivers, like 16 year olds who are driving for the first time, even if they have a peer who is sitting silently in the car, no verbal interaction, they will still drive more recklessly than not having a peer in the car or having an adult in the car. There's just a powerful effect on having people that you trust with you. And we know that. We know that there are certain people in our lives that can influence us more than other people. 
So each of us have that, right? So for those faculty members, for those colleagues who might not be in the room right now, um, who might be a little bit more resistant to change, they have a friend who has some influence over them. It might not be the CTL director, it might not be us, so like always think about your plus one. Think about your spheres of influence and think about who's around you. And also, I am always gonna operate under the benefit of the doubt that most human beings do not wanna hurt other human beings. Right? So if we're approaching it in terms of, like here's how success, documenting success, um, assessment's really important, showing that you know, we have data, 24% bump, right, and belonging, like showing what can happen and what's possible. Some of that is gonna depend on you, the choir, and your own networks, and you change one person, you change a world for everybody that person it comes into contact with. That's how it's been working. So, like, I think about it in terms of, like, pollination. If we can all just be, like, bees and <laughs> pollinate those in our spheres of influence. I thought of something as you were talking about the feedback and the affirmation, and over the years as I walking through the library and teaching my classes, I've been very deliberate in smiling. Yeah. And it's, especially going to the library, I realized I walk through to a restaurant or a coffee shop, and if I see a student, I'll smile. I make a deliberate attempt to smile. And at the beginning of every class, I make a deliberate attempt to smile, um, even if I'm having a lousy day. Mm -hmm. and, and I do think it goes a long way. Um, oh, it absolutely you're not does. Feeling it, um, but to smile, and, and sometimes you get smile back. Yep. You know, and that that feels good, you know. And and if they don't, then that's fine too. But I um, I I have over the years become more and more aware of the power of smile. Mm -hmm. So verbal language is relatively new in the evolution of human beings. We're much more respondent to body language than we acknowledge or give ourselves credit for. So that's really important, like smiling or any other body language that we can use. Like you can, you can see my dress right now. Like I purposely do this untucked shirt thing that I got the tie on so people can't tell am I really professional or am I not? <laughs> I just got out of bed. So I, all of this is very calculated in terms of how I present myself to students. I also, my Zoom profile picture, is blathers from Animal Crossing. I have no idea if that makes any sense to you, but um, Animal Crossing is a fun video game, no violence, all about building the community together. So when people see that and they recognize it, I've had like our human resources specialists be like, you play Animal Crossing too? Again, I'm just trying to communicate that smile in different ways to know like what I'm all about and what these spaces are. You get hand up as well. Yeah, on the opposite side of that, like, you said even if, like smiling if you're having a lousy day, mm -hmm. I have found it especially since um, like pandemic and like certainly since like lockdown, like Zoom teaching on pandemic, I've tried to become like as open as I can with students about like, hey, I'm having a hard day. Mm -hmm. Like I canceled mm -hmm. class last week and I'm like, I just can't do it today. <laughs> um, and that's been really helpful too because like I give them a lot of leeway as far as deadlines and attendance, um, but then ask the same for them in return. Yep. And I think that's, it's helpful for both me and I hope it's helpful for them too. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm not gonna show this as a strategy because I experimented with this so I'm still not sure how I felt about it. I did want a class with no attendance policy whatsoever. I was like, you can show up or you don't have to show up. And my presentation of this to students was, one, like, this is not compulsory schooling anymore. You're paying for this. It would be, it would almost, like an attendance policy in my mind would be like, if Subaru, I have a Subaru, would send me a notice saying, did you drive your car X amount of miles this month? Otherwise, we're gonna take it away from you. Right, like it, it was, this is weird. So like I communicated this to student and then what I incorporated was what I call the FOMO approach. Like how do I just induce FOMO? Where like <laughs> if you're missing now, like you're afraid of not coming to class because like we did something that was cool and exciting and you heard about it from other students. Um, it worked really well, but like I also just like, I need to test it in other spaces and context and then I, it might also be a publication that I'll work on. But I, I thought about exactly that. Like what happens if I just treat students like human beings that are part of a community and say like I know instead of the attendance policy which was like you miss X amount of days you're gonna get this amount of points docked it was more if you can't show up you need to communicate to your community members because I do a lot of teamwork um, that you can't be here to make sure someone is covering for you and so I, I had students say like like Linda can't be here today but it's all right I got it like she's covered um, and then try to teach that agency and co-ownership um, so yeah, it's same. I, I think we can get a lot more with transparency and shared vulnerability than we can through that through the traditional method of discipline. So adding to that, and I agree with everything that you've said. Again, I need to situate myself. I'm a social worker. 
I teach the practice classes. So I teach empathy, active listening, vulnerability, all of these things. But one of the things that I teach and that I'm transparent about being really open and honest and genuine about who I am and where I am, not only do we need empathy, but we also need to understand that we will have empathic failures Ooh, yeah. and we need them. Yeah. We need the rupture so that we can have the repair. Yeah. We have to fail a little bit in order to learn. Growth moments, by definition, are not comfortable most of the time. Mm -hmm. And so I will, at the beginning of the semester, say pretty much that um, and challenge folks in my class. Like, if you're comfortable in this class all the time, I'm not doing my job right. Mm -hmm. It's not, you know. Um, and like with assessment, I'll talk about, I, I see this as a conversation between the two of us, and you know, put it that way, and I'll mess up. And I catch myself messing up. And that is so powerful in the classroom. Absolutely. Um, so quick plug, I absolutely love New Hampshire. If I could come back one day, I have a presentation that's all about like how care leads to resilience. <laughs> And you're totally right. So when we're talking about care, compassion, kindness, and empathy, that does not mean reduce rigor. In fact, the science shows us. Harder. Exactly. I'm exactly. Like, you go ahead and call social worker a snowflake. <laughs> <laughs> because, honey, I have something to show you about what snowflake Exactly. Right? In fact, the more caring that we demonstrate and that we build in, the higher the stakes. We can raise those stakes high. We can ask them incredible things from our students, and they will do it because they feel supported and cared for. We've always taken this weird individualistic definition of resilience from like the Angela Duckworth grit model where it's like you have it or you don't or like man up or whatever like bootstraps all those different things that we've said <laughs> where we know that resilience is actually tied to care right it's social and the more people feel cared about the more they will do yeah I think that is a really terrific closing for this event. So, um, I want to present you with the Beekman 1802. I thought it was just a bag I had. I <laughs> <laughs> but we've got some of our collab swag, some zines. We've made a bunch of stuff. Collab t-shirts, some maple cool. syrup to take home with you. Um, a camp package. It's a little package for you, and we're so grateful that you came. Um, I hope folks will stick around for another 15 minutes if you want, um, have another drink, finish off the food. Um, but thank you all for coming. Hopefully we can do more of this. It's really nice to see all of your faces. So thanks for coming and thank you. Thank you. Thank you.